Okay. Welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the session on machine learning and statistics at the 25th Blizzard Season Conference. We are honored to have Professor Susan Murphy from Harvard University as our next plenary speaker. She's a professor of statistics, Radcliffe alumni professor at the Radcliffe Institute, and also a professor of computer science at Harvard Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Professor Murphy works on clinical trial designs and online learning algorithms for developing mobile health policies. She is a 2013 MacArthur Fellow, member of the National Academy of Sciences and also National Academy of Medicine. She is currently president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Today's title of the title is Challenges in Developing Learning Algorithms to Personalize Treatment in Real Time. Please join me in welcoming Professor Murphy. Okay, it's, um, it's great to be here with all you guys. Um, so what I'm going to try, and I'm going to talk to you about the challenges we confronted as we go through. We're right in the middle of the third phase of this study. Uh, and I'll make an effort to try and bring to the four things that, challenges I think that are open. Uh, I may not always phrase it in a way that might make the most sense to this audience, and so it'd be cool if you ask me questions, because then the challenges will be come to the fore. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about, first of all, we're going to talk about why, do, why are we even interested in experimenting in mobile health. Um, and it's because there's two types of treatments that, if you download an app that's supposed to help you, uh, from the Google Play Store, you'll see this. There's two types of treatments that occur in these apps. One is um, pulls. Pulls are just sitting on the phone. Um, there's usually a ton of them. And you can go at any given time and access it. So like if you're struggling with alcoholism, you can find at any given time where the nearest time and space Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. So you choose when you're going to access that. These are great. There's always a ton of them on any app. The other is a push, and the push is where things get really interesting. So the reason why, so a push is when uh, the app or wearable interrupts you in your life and attempts to provide some sort of treatment. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, often when you need help, you're less likely to realize you need that help. Maybe you've forgotten, maybe you're under a lot of cognitive burden, whatever. So thus, if the device can somehow detect that and realize you need help, maybe we can help you better. So it's a big promise. Uh, you don't have to recognize you need help. The device will do that for you. Uh, that's the promise. The, uh, the bad thing about this is it interrupts you in your life. It's very aggravating. If you've ever downloaded an app, you'll know what I mean. Uh, so how do you figure out when you should send these push treatments, these different kinds of messages and ideas, suggestions, to a user, yet not overburden them, not aggravate them? That's the reason why you start thinking about learning, right? It's because there's both pros and cons. It's not just pros, but also cons. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about micro-randomized trials. This is just a, a name for a type of clinical trial in which, if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, this is uh, a, a particular behavior policy was implemented to choose the treatments. So um, a micro-randomized trial is a trial in which each individual is randomized many, many times. Um, could be thousands of uh, times we have trials 5,000 randomizations, for example. Uh, how do these randomizations occur? They're almost, in my experience, they're always coming about through some sort of constrained optimization algorithm. So, and you're going to see this in the talk today, I'm going to attempt to solve a constrained optimization problem. And of course, I won't really know the criteria, so I'm going to have to learn the criterion, unknown parameters in that criterion, as I attempt to solve that problem and to then spread out the. Um, and I said that these are constrained because usually there is a probabilistic uh, budget on the number of times you should bother that individual in a given time slot. Say, for example, on average we want to send two messages per day. That would be a probabilistic constraint. 
So there's, there are always constrained optimization problems. The, then there's this soft aspect to them that's, I don't, I haven't, I'm only beginning to try and figure out how to operationalize. And that is, and that's the last bullet point, is when you run a study like this, these are real clinical trials, you know, they're with patients. There's a lot of people who are involved, and they're going to want to take that data after you've collected it and do all kinds of other analyses, often related to causal inference, um, maybe off policy. So you have to, you can't, you have to run the trial in a way so that other people can attempt to address the questions they care about. So how does the data look? Um, and we're going to see a specific example shortly. Uh, I'll make this concrete. But on every user, you have this time series, uh, context, action, reward. That's the language I'll use here. S is the context, context or state. So that's usually a variety of sensor stream, uh, data from sensors as well as potentially self-report. Uh, then there's some action that you could take at any given time. And today, all we're going to do is talk about binary actions. Deliver a message versus don't deliver a message. Um, of course, there's different kinds of messages at all uh, as well, but we're going to focus just on whether we bother the individual or we don't bother the individual. Notice my language here. Um, and then there's something we want to achieve, we're trying to achieve by sending that message, and that's the reward. It's some near-term outcome, and you're going to see a concrete example shortly. So um, Heart Steps, this is a study for, um, it's a series, it was funded by NIH to build a uh, mobile app for people who are at high risk of cardiac, uh, adverse cardiac events, and particular people who have hypertension. Uh, and we went through the 42-day study, we just finished the 90-day study, and we're starting the nine-month, the last study. Um, and I'll talk to you more about that as well. Um, but this, uh, just as a, this, this uh, app has a wearable, a tracker, as well, as, and it, it gets a step count from the tracker, and it also uses a variety of sensors on the phone as well to collect data. So there's two algorithms that are being run on this app, I mean, in this platform right now. And the first is what we call a sequential risk time sampling algorithm. And here's the, here's the problem. So the problem was uh, people are, uh, this is people with uh, stage one, uh, either sedentary or stage one hypertension, depending on the study. And you want to disrupt sedentary behavior because that's really a adverse. So, um, and people are, different people are sedentary different amounts of the time. Uh, and from one day to the next, you're sedentary, differing amounts of time. And we had a budget around an average of one and a half times per day that we should send a message to disrupt uh, sedentary behavior. Uh, and the, that budget comes from the domain scientists. They're very concerned about over sending too many messages, but aggravating users. So it's this probabilistic budget, on average, send one and a half messages. So if an oracle would come down and told me ahead of time, well, Joe here, he's going to be sedentary five times today, and I have a budget of one and a half, I would just randomize him with probably one and a half divided by five at each of those five times, and I'd be done with it. And that way, I spread out those me messages across his sedentary times. Of course, we don't have an oracle. We don't know how often someone will be sedentary on any given day. So what happens is in this algorithm, what it does is every time someone is detected to be sedentary, it makes a prediction of how many more times they're likely to be sedentary in the remaining part of the day. And then it uses that prediction to determine the randomization probability for that particular time. And then it just redoes that at each time. It turns out this algorithm is working like a charm. I'm not going to really talk about it because it is working like a charm, so I don't need feedback. Uh, but there's still a lot of, yeah? Like, what's the definition of like Yeah, in this study, it's, um, and this is kind of classical, it's a classical definition. It's you've been uh, 40 minutes with less than 150 steps. And so as soon as you reach that threshold, you're declared to be sedentary. And that's when this prediction has to occur and the randomization probability is determined. Yeah. Uh, and of course, 
so the goal here is to uh, uh, minimize some sort of, and we were, when we operationalized this, minimize some sort of callback libeler distance between the uniform distribution and our randomization, right? That would be kind of how you might uh, mathematize this problem. And how do we actually do it is we form these predictions and then update the randomization probability. Also, the way we did these predictions, they're not personalized. So we formed the predictions based on existing uh, V1, the first study data, and then we just input the person's current context to use the prediction. I'm positive one could do a, one could operationalize this problem, do a much better job, uh, and but we, you know, uh, at this time that's not we. This is good enough for what we need to do. Our real problems are on the reinforcement learning algorithm, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, so, um, so with this algorithm here, again, we're, again, in my mind, I'm thinking randomization. So the idea here is that we're going to select the treatment action, uh, binary actions here, send a message versus not, uh, at each time with the, the goal of uh, maximizing some, uh, the sum of rewards over some horizon, capital H. Uh, and again, this will be subject to soft constraints. Uh, we can't, we'll see that there's f five times a day at which you might be able to send this particular uh, message, uh, and uh, we don't want to send it more than an average of four times per day. So there is constraints, uh, again, on this. So I'm going to really spend all the entire rest of this talk on this reinforcement learning algorithm. Yeah? So just to clarify, when you say that the treatment is binary, you, uh, is the message that's sent always the same? No. Okay. It looks totally different every time. You will never get the same message twice. Yeah, and actually the message, the content of the message is tailored to the sensor data we have at hand. So like it's tailored to your current location, what the weather's like outside, uh, day of the week, and time of the day. So it really, uh, that's another issue entirely. Yeah, exactly. I won't even focus on it. Sorry, just a question. Yeah. What's the rewarding in this context? Uh-huh. What's the rewarding? Yeah, I'm going to talk to you right now. Okay. Uh, so what is the action here? <coughs> it's a tailored activity suggestion. What happens is your phone lights up and it uh, pings, it audibly pings, and on the lock screen you get a little message. Yeah, you can see this when I got this, this in the morning. It was very cold. I was in Michigan. It was really cold. And you can see it's trying to help me manage my expectations. Look, it's not so bad. Uh, you want to walk today? And then I have several ways to wipe it off, which were ways to unobtrusively collect more data, whether or not I thought it was useful and so on. Um, and this could occur at five times a day. Uh, there was an enormous amount of science, enormous amount of behavioral science. Um, mixing behavioral and data science goes in into determining these five times. We had vast amounts of data from the tracker uh, to try and figure out uh, what would be good times. Originally we were going to do it every minute, so we'd have many, many times per day, but then when we looked at people who had regular jobs, uh, there were around five times associated with their job when they tended to have the greatest within person variance in their physical activity. Large within person variance in your physical activity indicates that you might be able to influence that person. And these five times are all related to your work schedule. So if I'm in there and somebody else is in there, these five times are different uh, depending on when we go to work. Uh, and the reward here is the 30-minute step count. And that, there's a whole bunch of science that goes into that. I just, I'm not going to go into that here. Um, the, the bottom line is if you can leave your context very quickly, you don't want to have a reward going over a longer period of time because this message will not even be useful in a totally different context. And you also have to think of how soon people are likely to respond. But, uh, but right now, we're just going to swallow that. It's the 30-minute step count. And the purpose of these messages are to help the individual be more active where they are right now. Um, so I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to list some of the challenges that I want to just focus on today. So uh, this is sort of, this is aspirational. Um, 
this goal is aspirational. So I'm going to talk about our online algorithm. This is how we're going to randomize those actions at those five times, the binary actions at five times. So the goal, um, the aspirational goal is to learn which actions maximize this sum of rewards over our horizon of length h. Um, and uh, you see I'm just using the notation of the lowercase r is just the conditional mean of my 30 minute step count given the current context and current action. Um, so that's the goal. I want to, of course, I can't really do this. Uh, I don't have an oracle. I don't know this, this uh, mean reward, the conditional mean reward. I don't know that form. I don't know the distribution of the context as it comes up. So I can't do, I have to learn as I go and make decisions. So um, this is something, uh, I think this is probably really obvious to John here, but it took me about a, don a ton of years, I won't say how many, to realize that every RL algorithm if you're, has two, is two algorithms. And every time you see someone form an RL algorithm, you should ask them, you know, because they're mixing and matching. They're mixing and matching two algorithms. One algorithm is a learning algorithm, and that's an algorithm that's uh, forming some sort of model. It may not be a complete model of the system, but it may just be a model for the Q function or the value function, for example. Um, and the other algorithm is the experimentation strategy. That is, how are they choosing the actions? And so there's a lot of really popular algorithms like the uh, UCB, Optimism in the Face of Uncertainty, that use internal variation to choose actions. And then there's other algorithms that use external variation in the experimentation strategy. We're going to use the external here. Um, so what are some of the, the challenges in this particular context? Uh, the rewards, those 30 minute step counts, generally are pretty noisy. And the reason why is you're running an experiment as people are running around doing, you know, have, living out their life. Um, so all kinds of things can happen and disrupt them, even if they get a message uh, or not. Uh, so it's hard to learn. Uh, and worse still, the users are not tolerant. They don't like being bothered. Um, and so you really want to try and uh, avoid disengagement by the user. Also, I mentioned this uh, as well, since these are clinical trials, there's a whole variety of stakeholders that are interested and you, need, you want to facilitate them being able to do a variety of causal inference analyses, off-policy analyses afterwards. Um, the third challenge I want to focus here is that uh, it's really peculiar and it took me a while to realize this. And I've tried to emphasize it today to make it really to overt. You know, you are interrupting someone. So if we think of the action as binary, send a message, interrupt the person versus not interrupt the person, then in the near time, right away, you're probably, if you're going to have any effect, it might be positive. So sending a little tailored activity suggestion, if anything, it might help that person to be a little bit more active in the, over the next 30 minutes. But longer term, the signal, the greatest signal you're likely to see is negative, uh, aggravation. So it's a really interesting juxtaposition of near time positive reward uh, impacts. I'm just talking about the signal to noise ratio. Most of the signal tends to be positive in the near time and most of the signal in the delay, uh, delayed sense tends to be negative. There's other signals as well. But Okay, so let's go on to the heart step study. So in the first study, it was a 42-day study. These were people who had regular jobs. They didn't have hypertension, uh, but they did have, they were sedentary and they were similar, similar age group to the people that would come in the next study. And some, here's some of the results. So in this study, uh, it was a 42-day study, and we actually did experiment at each of those five times for each individual whether to send this message or not, this tailored activity suggestion. Uh, and it was phenomenally successful. Uh, initially, early in the study, it more than doubled an individual step count. So if you got a message versus if you didn't, they tended to have more than double the number of steps that they otherwise would have. 
It was, you know, just wonderful. But by three weeks in, that's halfway, it's a six week study, halfway through, it's over. Everything's gone. And um, so what's going on here? And there were a number of, you know, we thought, well, burden, um, uh, we did a number of secondary analyses. And the end result was, the conclusion was, this was most likely habituation. So if you're familiar with what habituation is, I'm talking about it from a negative point of view. Um, if you get a signal repeatedly, uh, eventually you just don't even see the signal. You don't hear it, you don't perceive the signal. It's not that you're disengaged, you just don't perceive it. And so what people do ordinarily in uh, psychology, for example, is they attempt to get you to dishabituate. So they back off, they don't send the signal anymore, and then they start signaling again in the hope that you'll notice it again. So when we saw this, this is cert this certainly, we couldn't explain, uh, uh, this is, in a, is, some, uh, is a sort of a non-stationarity, uh, this first number one, uh, and we thought, well, it's probably likely due to habituation. So when we think of an RL algorithm, we're thinking in our mind, we want something that will back off if it detects a decrease in responsivity to allow you to dishabituate. I mean, this is what we had. Uh, also, uh, we had information on a variety of near-time measures of burden, uh, some of which, because of bugs in the software code, we didn't, didn't get collected, and others turned out not to be, didn't appear to be related at all. So, um, the features, though, that were related are here in blue. Um, so, uh, how, mu how many messages had you gotten recently? If you had gotten a lot of re messages recently, you tended to be less responsive, which makes sense with my story, the story I'm giving you right now. Also, if your step count, if you were very variable in your step count over in that hour, over the last seven days or so, you tended to be more responsive. The more variable, the more responsive. Uh, location was also another one. If you were at home or work, you were more responsive. So this, these blue features, uh, they're the features we think when we think about a policy. We th we're thinking in our mind they're probably going to be in that policy. There were other features that might predict reward, but these are the ones. Yeah? Do you see any increase in activity at all? Like, even though they're not necessarily increasing activity after they get a message, is their activity level increased at all over these weeks? Yeah, there was other, these are factorial designs. I'm hiding so much from you, right? So there were other factors that were at the daily level, and they looked at daily step count, and um, those factors had a really nice effect. So people did increase their entire step count, but it didn't stick around again. So you can imagine, this is a 42-day study. The next study is 90 days. The next study is nine months. You know, we've got to get our act together here, right? Uh, so, uh, so how can we use something akin to an RL algorithm it, with these kinds of challenges to uh, what we would call dynamically personalize the binary treatment action? That is, to learn whether or not it's useful to send a message or not. Uh, depending on your current context at any of these five times a day. Uh, again, these are the decision points. Those five times relate to your work schedule and the reward, just like I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a bandit algorithm, and then I'm going to butcher it. Okay, so when I say, the minute I say bandit algorithm, you should think, oh, she means horizon equal one, H equal one. That's what she's talking about, at least for right now. Uh, so I just want to review it. I'm sh I think a lot of you know, uh, know about banded algorithms, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so uh, I have some model for my mean reward given context in action. Uh, that's that lower pair, case S, R of S, A. So how does the algorithm go? Uh, at each time point, I observe my context. My experimentation strategy then selects a treatment, send message versus not. Uh, I observe the reward, that's a 30 minute step count. And then the algorithm updates the parameters in that mean of the reward given uh, context and action. So do you run the learning algorithm separately for each person? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great question, and it meets. Uh, so what I want to do longer term is combine over people to meet that challenge. We need to learn faster. How you combine over people has to be done in a very thoughtful way. You don't just pool. The problem is if you're not thoughtful about how you com if. So we did not. Here we did. Everyone had their own algorithm. But we're going to deal with some other. You'll see some of the other things we did. But, uh, and why did we do that? Because if I use, suppose all of us are in this study. And I use one algorithm. I combine all. So, so uh, your activity yesterday, your responsivity yesterday influences what action I get today. Right? So even though before the study started, uh, we're completely independent. We don't even know each other. After the study's over, my time series is correlated with his time series. This is a disaster if you're talking about performing classical ana data analyses that people use in clinical trials. And so one has to, if you're going to pool over people, you have to then figure out some correction to all those data analyses that will occur later that accounts for the fact that we actually are correlated. We're giving them correlated time series. So that in itself is another very interesting challenge. And in the third study, actually part of the study they gave to us, and they're letting us pool in for part of the study. But they, yeah, it's a great question. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little, describe the the core of the algorithm a little bit more. So uh, we're thinking of a, a, well, we used a Gaussian linear model, say, think a Gaussian process model for the reward function. Um, so and, uh, what we do is, if you're thinking of a li uh, linear Thompson sampling bandit, you have prior, uh, priors on the regression coefficients here. I denoted them by uh, eta up there. These are the regression coefficients, and I have a Gaussian prior. And so my learning algorithm is just a Bayesian algorithm. It's just one where I'm updating a posterior distribution. It's a classical algorithm. Everything is great. It's all closed form. Uh, the posterior is Gaussian with a certain mean and a covariance, all in closed form. It's great. Just like, uh, and then my uh, uh, experimentation strategy in this framework of a linear Thompson sampling bandit, it's called posterior sampling. And what's posterior sampling is you, the randomization probability for the next treatment is set equal to the posterior probability that that treatment would be best in that context. Okay. Uh, so the summary is our learning algorithm is a Bayesian linear regression model, also called a Gaussian process model. Um, and depending on the complexity, how much data I have, I would have a more or less complex kernel for the Gaussian process model. Uh, the experimentation st strategy is posterior sampling. You select the next action with probability equal to the posterior probability that action is the better action. So in our binary case, it's very easy to write down. It's just the posterior probability that the reward under action one is greater than the, re the mean reward under action one is greater than the mean reward under action zero. That's all it is. That's the probability of sending an action equal one in that state S. Um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, mention this. Uh, I know some of you are well aware of this, but it's really important. And at first someone, uh, it's, it takes a while to realize this. So this Thompson sampling bandit, it's, it's just an approximation. It's not, uh, it's not optimally discovering how you should choose your actions in order to learn over the entire duration of the trial, say t time units. So in the 90-day trial, it's 90 times 5 to, uh, time units. It's not act actually directly doing that. And I just want to explain why. Uh, so if I wanted to, uh, so it, it, what it, does, it, it doesn't do is it doesn't uh, optimize how you balance exploration and exploitation. So if I really wanted to balance this and I had enough resources, it was hypothetical, uh, what I would do is I'd say, well, if I'm going to choose action one now, 
then I would roll out all the sequences, hold the sequence, any sequence of actions I could choose over the remaining part of the trial. Uh, average over all the states that would occur and the rewards that would be subsequent to those actions. And I would see the highest mean reward I'd get from choosing action one. And then I would do the same thing for action zero and I'd get the, see the highest mean reward that I would get from action zero. And it could be that, uh, remember we're in the bandit setting, so H is one, we're only seeking to maximize the current reward. Uh, it could be that action one is not the best decision in, in the current state, but you will choose, ac action one would lead to a higher average over that whole uh, future because I would learn that in that state, action one is not a great reward. <laughs> I mean, a great action to take. So, and that, so that rollout is what really balances exploration and exploitation. The thing is you can't do that in real life. And so what do we do? We use a poor man's uh, uh, approximate, uh, approach. Um, and, and what we do is we look at the posterior probability that action one is better than action zero to choose to determine the randomization. And in many settings, I mean, uh, at least to the first order, you, uh, the regret, for example, you, you get, a, it occurs at an optimal rate, so. Okay, so let's go to this. How are we going to deal with these challenges that we're confronting? So this, the fact that the algorithms learn slowly. So the obvious thing to do is to try and pool, but we couldn't do that here because we can't mess up our collaborators' ability to do analyses after the study at least not at this time. So what we, the first thing we did to deal with this was we looked at a, a low dimensional uh, reward model. That meant we had fewer parameters to learn online, right? And the smaller number of parameters I have to learn online, the greater in some sense the bias, because I might not have a flexible enough model, but uh, I have much lower variance. Uh, so we're doing a bias variance trade-off here. We ended up having um, uh, six parameters. Uh, the other thing we do is our priors are informative priors. So they're completely informative. And there's a whole science to how you might want to think about forming an informative prior in this setting. Um, and I don't know what that science is because as far as I can tell, no one's thought carefully about this. So uh, what we did was we took, uh, there should be a host science. So we took the prior study. Uh, we looked at which uh, coefficients appear to have a real uh, signal. We used their estimators, their estimated values as prior means. And then uh, the coefficients that had a statistically significant signal, we uh, kept their uh, variance and put that as a prior variance. And the, coefic the coefficients that didn't have a statistically significant signal, we, uh, what we did was we realized that you know, if you use a Bayesian algorithm with a Gaussian prior, what you're doing is you're doing L2 regularization, where the tuning parameter is one over the prior variance. So what we did was we halved the prior variance for those non-significant parameters so that it would shrink to zero and force the data in the new study to have more evidence. It'd be nice to have some more principles about this, some sort of second order kind of results that would inform that. I don't know anybody's looked at second order type results. Um, and then the last one was, how do you ensure ability to conduct causal inference of policy analyses? So this is the reason why we didn't use upper confidence bound methods here. Um, we use the posterior sampling because posterior sampling is just randomization. Uh, that's all it is. And so now we even know our algorithm outputs the randomization probability. So we can adjust for this adaptive sampling in the analyses because we know how we did it. We also, uh, if the uh, posterior probability of, uh, in favor of an action was greater than 0.8, we set it to be 0.8. And that was because of burden considerations. We didn't want an app more than an average of four messages per day. Uh, if the posterior probability of sending a message was lower than 0.1, we set it to be 0.1. Why did we do that? Very interesting. These are non-stationary problems. I'm pretending like they're not, but they are. 
And so point one is, so we all, the team got together and we decided, what, how often should you probe to see if there's responsivity to a message if at the moment you have no evidence that that message makes an impact? So how often should you probe? And that's, point, that's where point one came from. Uh, so the last one, and this is where we're going to spend all our time, is habituation. The algorithm, what we're really concerned about because of these delayed effects of aggravation, habituate, particularly habituation, we're concerned the algorithm is going to just learn treat all the time. It's abandoned. It just pays attention to the immediate reward. So what we wanted to do was move it a little closer to a full RL algorithm. But this is dangerous. This is really dangerous. Why? Because if you think about what the target is when you do RL, the target is the current reward plus some estimator of the future impact, the value. And our ability to estimate that future impact is really not good. High noise. And if I add too much noise to the target, the present reward, it's a disaster. <coughs> So, okay, so um, here's what we did. Um, so uh, we have this, we, uh, so here we have the differences. We're going to estimate, we're going to be modeling these rewards using that uh, Gaussian process model. Uh, and then we add a term to it, uh, which is going to proxy the effects of uh, choosing, sending a message versus not in future. And the idea was to form a very low variance signal for that. Uh, now, if the person is starting to habituate, we expect this is going to be negative, right? So that the posterior, so that the probability of this being greater than zero is lower, and I'm less likely to send a message. That's what we have in our mind. So what do we do? We formed a proxy Markov decision process. It's sort of obvious that we, you should do something in this line, but ours was very crude. We made the dose. Uh, the dose, of course, can evolve determinist deterministically. And all the other states, we just sample from their current empirical distribution for that individual. So how does it go? Uh, so at every time point, you update the empirical distribution of states for that person. You, uh, you have your model for the reward function. Of course, that model includes all kinds of states. Uh, S, dose is only one of the variables in S. So you, what you do is you average this over the empirical distribution of all the other states. And so you end up with a reward just of the dose and action. Then we solved for an opt, uh, the optimal value function in MDP. Uh, and uh, we ended up with the the value of the uh, at each dose. And we do this uh, at regular time intervals. So to summarize, uh, our algorithm is uh, a Bayesian linear regression algorithm. Our experimentation strategy uh, uses the model from this learning algorithm to form the, me the means for the rewards. And then we uh, put we act as if this is deterministic, uh, and it's an, this estimator. So it's the expected value of the next dose given the current dose, and you choose a mess, you send a message, minus the expected value of the next dose given the current dose, and you don't choose a message. This gamma was 0.95. We actually chose it as a tuning parameter. It was used as a tuning parameter. So we, if you, if someone is starting to habituate. They're decreasing in their responsivity. You expect this difference to be negative. Okay. So um, before the second study started, we thought, well, well, we're working on this. We used the current study to see, does it make any sense? Is there any hope? And there were 37 people in the current study. So each column represents a person here, okay? And what we did was we used three-fold three cross-validation. Uh, we would build the algorithm on two folds and then run it in a pretend way on the, out, the, the one fold that we left out. And we would see how much better did it do or worse did it do than not including the proxy MDP. And you can see 
for a lot of the people, it looks like we did a, it did a lot better. So we were we really had that's the positive. We thought, oh, you know, this has got potential. Okay, so now I'm going to start. I'm going to show you the results from one of the users in this study because this study just went on this fall. Um, so this is one of the users. Um, and I don't know the gender or uh, any, I don't know the demographics of this user yet. We haven't gotten to the entire data set yet. Uh, but this user at the very beginning, uh, so, so the horizontal, uh, the, the vertical axis is the posterior mean of the treatment effect. So it's a contrast between getting a message versus not. And it's a prediction. It, it's a posterior mean. So each dot is, is as, it's like a forecast of what you think the treatment effect will be at that next time. Okay. It's not what it was at that time. It's what you think it will be at that time. Um, and then across the horizontal axis, you see the days. This, so this is mid-September. This user was uh, completed the study. Uh, and this user was a pretty responsive uh, uh, ended up really being, and you can tell because uh, you get these predictions of that the user will be responsivity, and at the next time point, those predictions continue to be positive. They would go down, of course, if the user is not responsive. And then something happens somehow in July, late July, where either the the context is changing, or uh, I don't. That's I don't think that's the case here. Actually, it's more that the user begins to habituate and just doesn't see the messages anymore. And then you have this. So what happens, I'm going to show you the randomization probabilities next. And we made certain realizations which are sort of obvious, but we didn't realize them. We didn't anticipate them. But oh, I, I can talk about that later. So the probability is the largest you can get is 0.8, the smallest you can get is 0.1. Uh, this, the user is very responsive, as we saw early in the study. So they're getting an that person is getting an average of four messages a day because the person is just so responsive. And then they stop being responsive. We saw that downturn, and the probabilities start to decrease, right? Which is good. That means uh, it's responding to um, that decrease in effectiveness. I'll talk to you a little bit more about this. There's some real problems here. Well, I just want to go on just for the second, just for a second. Um, so here's three points. Uh, the first is, uh, I guess it's blue, green, and purple. Blue, green, and purple. They're, they're, they're decreased. So these are all four posterior means, which get a little bit lower, but not much as time goes on. And this is the first one as uh, in the deterioration of effect effectiveness. And uh, that corresponds to this probability here, so it's backed off. But you can already see one problem, uh, at least that we were very concerned with. And that is that these randomization probabilities, they're not backing off soon enough. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if we can solve that or not, but uh, we would like the randomization probabilities to back off a little bit earlier, and they backed off a little later. Um, but essentially, the probabilities are mirroring that posterior mean. And these probabilities are the output of the posterior mean, the posterior standard deviation, and the proxy for the delayed effects. So what role is the proxy playing here? That's what I want to show you on the next slide. So, uh, okay, so let me talk to you about what the proxy is. So, the, uh, so uh, in the, to get the posterior probability, since we have a Gaussian prior, it's, it's a Gaussian model, uh, the posterior probability is a normal CDF applied to the posterior mean divided by the posterior standard deviation times this factor, 1 plus the delayed effects divided by the posterior mean. So I just want to, I'm going to say it again. Uh, the posterior probability, the randomization probability of sending a message is the normal CDF applied to the posterior mean divided by the posterior standard deviation times this factor. So if we had a straight up bandit, eta would be zero, and it would just be the normal CDF applied to the posterior mean divided by the posterior standard deviation. So this factor here tells you what, what role the proxy is playing. And what happened here is you see the, the pro so these, these numbers are all fractions. It's reducing the effect, it's reducing that treatment effect, posterior mean over posterior standard deviation, because 
these are fractions less than one. And uh, what we see is that time goes on, it, the proxy punishes the estimate of effectiveness more and more and more. And what's happening is it's anticipating more habituation in the future, more delayed effects in the future. Okay, I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of problems, just so you'll know. You might have noticed this. I'm going to go back to the next slide. Can anybody tell? Okay, I'm just going to lead you on a little bit. Notice early in the study, there's really no evidence of anything going on with this, this user. Zero estimate, near zero estimated treatment effect. Yet the posterior probability is close to 0.5. What's wrong here? This is completely a bad idea. Right? The last thing you want to do is randomize with probably 0.5 if there's no current evidence of effectiveness. But a posterior, the posterior probability is like a p-value. It's a Bayesian hypothesis test in a sense. And we have no evidence of a treatment effect, so it chooses 0.5. So what happened was around this date, 9-6, September 6, we did a, a whole reanalysis of the data. And we changed the, the uh, what would happen if the posterior probability was 0.5. We changed it so that it would become closer to 0.1. Or 0.2, I think. At first we tried 0.2. And that's why you see this after this dashed line, this individual becomes less receptive again, less responsive, and thus the randomization probabilities really drop. Who knows, maybe if that would have happened earlier, this person would have been, they would have, had, they would have gone right back up to their normal, their early responsivity. Okay, I just want to list, list a couple of questions here. How do you design a trial in health in which you say you're going to have dynamic personalization? Um, Idealistically, what you might want to do is maximize the total reward over some given horizon, subject to lower bounds on the power to detect particular causal effects. All clinical trials, the way you justify them to funders, is you make a guarantee about some power that you're going to have to detect something, some effect, some treatment effect. So you want to maintain that guarantee, yet you want to allow personalization. And so if you think about this, this is, I think, important even if you roll this out. So, let's, so this study is going on at Kaiser in Seattle. Let's say Kaiser decides to roll this out, app out. Then we all know that mobile digital technology, I mean, technology is changing really fast. You're going to have to have regular rebuilds of this algorithm and this app. So every time you have a rebuild, you're going to want to do a bunch, a bunch of analyses, and you would like to have sufficient power to, to, to address those analyses. So even in a rollout, you might want to think in this constrained way. Uh, what we did instead is we took a poor man's view of the problem. What we did was we, uh, you saw I, I have bounds on my randomization probabilities, 0.8 and 0.1. And by putting those bounds on there, I ensured that we would have enough exploration so that I could test my hypotheses afterwards. But that's extremely crude. Uh, but that's how we did it here. Uh, the other thing that's become really apparent to us is there's two sets of assumptions. There's one set of assumptions that you use to do your personalization, to build your algorithm. You might use some mechanistic modeling as well, some control theory, if you have that available to do your personalization. But then when you go to do these analyses, these uh, causal inference analyses, you don't want to have those assumptions. And so whatever algorithm you use to run the clock trial, whatever personalization algorithm you use to run the trial, you don't want it to preclude the ability, you don't want the person analyzing the data after the trial to make your assumptions. You want a robust learning RL algorithm, an algorithm that will not mess up everything so that you can't do off-policy learning or you can't 
completely preclude all off-policy learning. You want to be able to permit causal inference. Uh, you want to, uh, actually it turns out there's often, in our studies, there's multiple outcomes we care about. We just have one that we really care about a lot. We make our guarantee on the one we care about a lot. And then we have other outcomes like engagement and whether or not people enjoy physical activity, things like that. Uh, you want to be able to an anal do analyses for those other outcomes. And they all should be valid even if the model assumptions that you made in your RL algorithm or your banded algorithm are false. So uh, where is this all going? Uh, this is my goal sort of in my life. Uh, the, what I want is I want uh, a place like Kaiser uh, uh, to have an app like this that they roll out, say, to all their bariatric surgery patients. Um, and in that app, it'll have a number of interventions, you know, how they can manage their weight, how can they manage stress, how can they manage their eating, and so on. But it'll also have one end of the interventions will be an algorithm. One or more of the interventions will be an algorithm. And it'll be an RL algorithm. And um, that algorithm will be constantly trading bias and variance in order to continually personalize and track that person. So thanks so much for the questions. Uh, and these are, I, here I have pictures of my uh, collaborators. There's computer scientists, a lot of sensor guys on here, uh, behavioral scientists. Pung, uh, he did a lot of the development of the banded algorithm. Uh, human computer interaction scientists. A whole bunch of people have to get together to run studies like this. Thanks. Uh -huh. So I really, I really like the, the uh, conceptualization of habitualization as this uh, delayed reward concept. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, for um, just so I have a bit more context, is, is it is it well understood if habitualization is uh, is something to that you would like to avoid, or how, to what extent can, do you want to, or can you mitigate habitualization? Yes. Yeah, so there's two types of habituation you want. There's a habituation you want and there's one that you don't want. So the one you don't want is that they start to not notice your messages anymore. Uh, so that's the habituation that I talked about here. The other habituation that you want, the one that you want, is that they start to form good habits in their life and they start to be active, like they almost have very few sedentary periods, for example. So they're forming good habits. The problem with that is the signal of forming a habit is really hard. Yet, the signal of aggravation, burden, and habituation is much stronger. <laughs> and so, that's one of the things we're really thinking about hard right now, is how do we try and extract the signal of forming a good habit so that we can, we can have, a, so that we have two types of delayed effects, right? More positive and negative. Uh, and I'm, you know, we definitely want to do that. Yeah, I'm on board. Any other question? I have, yeah. I have a similar question about these long-term effects because really in behavioral sciences, having long-lasting effects by intervention is, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, what was the context, the state that determines when you deliver these notifications? Probably I was just thinking, one of the ways people suggest about making these good habits mm -hmm. is by something they call habit stacking. Mm -hmm. you, you use a current habit, like consistent habit like eating, right. and deliver some notifications to instigate the other behavior on top of this That's habit. right. That's right. Yeah, that's called anchoring. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, so here we weren't doing that. Um, in another, in a, well, it's the study we're writing a grant for right now. We're trying to get people to self-monitor, and we want them to anchor it whenever they brush their teeth. And so you only give a reinforcer if they self-monitor at the time, right after they brush their teeth. That's what you're talking about. Here it was. So these times are anchored for the person, but we didn't connect it so much. So like, it's right before I go to work. It's right at midday when I normally take my lunch. 
It's right in my middle afternoon, right when I leave work, right around dinner, right after dinner. You know, so it is at specific times, but the messages themselves don't enforce that. And you don't yeah, do because it. of and, adaptation. Right, right. So one could try and do that. But my, my gut feeling right now where we are in this game, at least the game I'm in, if you're more about using data, um, is the real signal here is mainly burden and uh, habitual. You know, is it worth it to interrupt that person or not? Uh, and the way in which you interrupt them, pretty much, I can't, we, like there were two different types of messages that were sent here, and it's very hard to see a signal to see a difference between the messages. The data is just too noisy. It's just really noisy data. But you get a signal for habituation, for interruption. Yeah. I mean, does it also depend sort of on what kind of like the person, him or herself, like the motivation of the person, whether you know like the person tries to improve the lifestyle or just try to sort of force to uh, install the app or something? Right. So everyone in these studies, they enter because they are motivated. That's how they get into the study. But the problem is, you can be motivated for a week, but are you going to be motivated three weeks later? Yeah. You know, life intervenes. And um, so one could say that maybe habituation and motivation got intertwined here uh, because around three weeks out we weren't seeing an effect, right? That would be, at least when you talk, your question makes me think that. Um, however, for example, with this user, this last user that I showed you, this person, individual does actually... Um, recover somewhat, just doesn't recover. I mean, it's still a positive effect, and it lasts the whole. And also, we had other components which had positive effects the entire duration of the study. So, but they weren't during, they were just like once a day, like at the, in the morning or in the night. Whereas this comes up as you're trying to go through your day when you're walking around. And somehow that's a different ball game when you try and uh, get someone's attention as they're going through their life. Thank you very much. Thank you.